This is digitizing Delmarva heritage and traditions. Today, we're speaking to Julia Allen Hancock from her home on Somerset Avenue in Salisbury. Now, I'm going to say hi, Betsy, after I've just introduced <laughs> you as Julia, Julia Allen Hancock. Why Betsy? Well, my full name before I was married was Julia Elizabeth Allen. And Betsy is a nickname for the sure. name Ju uh, Elizabeth. So I legally, of course, I have to use the Julia because that it, Julia E. Allen, and then even my uh, when I vote, I have to write Julia E. Hancock, and because I just changed my last name, presumably. Mm -hmm. But I certainly am happy and proud to be an Allen, so I use that initial for my middle. Well, it's that Allen tradition that we want to talk about primarily today. Fine. We'll talk about anything you want to talk about. But uh, <laughs> let's start with uh, the late W.F. Allen, yes. who was a very prominent businessman here in Wicomico County. Now, what was the W.F. Allen business? <clears throat> well, W.F. Allen, which stands for William Francis Allen, uh, started out, as I understand it, he, I think he was born down in Allen, Maryland, and he started out with $15 when, uh, about the time that he married Martha P. Twilley. And he started, <laughs> as I understand it, a seed farm. Now, I'm not just certain what kinds of seeds uh, they had, but uh, they also had blueberry plants and I think some other things which I'm not familiar with. But when Camden Avenue was the main north-south Route 13, uh, right up there, a lot of people don't know where my grandparents' house was. And my Uncle Albert and Uncle Lee's houses are both across Camden Avenue. They're still in existence, not owned by them anymore. And the fruit stand was directly across from uh, Uncle Albert's house on Camden Avenue. And just north of the little fruit stand was a, a row of fig trees. And then the seed house, which was a large two-story building. And I think that's where they packaged and proce processed and packaged the seeds. That's how he started. Uh, he went from that to, I'm not just sure which came first, the strawberry plants or the peaches and apples. But when I was a, a young child, uh, they had a shed, an open shed, just a roof on poles next to the railroad track, uh, which was to the east of this home piece. And it was just a, a uh, dirt lane that ran from Camden back to the packing house. There was nothing. Route 13 on Business 13 wasn't even thought of it. It was all time. farmland. It was all farmland, that's right. And so when he started having orchards and they started shipping by train, the peaches and apples, they use this shed, which apparently is still in existence, except it's been closed in and the roof raised and all sorts of things to it. I don't recognize it as being the original building because mm -hmm. uh, it was wide open to the elements, but it had machinery in there that uh, with uh, Dad would get link belt to make the, the uh, relay, the, the I can't think of the proper term. Anyhow, the, the fruit would come up on and be graded. And oh, on a conveyor belt. A conveyor belt, that's exactly it. Sorry. Anyhow, um, and then they would be packed into bushel baskets, and, uh, and then the train, there was a siding there, and the train would send in a couple of freight cars, and then they would be loaded onto that and shipped to places like Philadelphia and New York and I don't know where else. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's how it, that part started, peaches and apples there. The strawberry plants, um, in, as I recall, the very early spring, they would start digging them in the fields. They never were really planted for the purpose of the strawberries themselves, although when there were strawberries, of course, they would get them picked and sell them, but they had, that had to more or less be locally. Uh, but the strawberry plants, and then there was the uh, 
plant packing house uh, where the plants were taken. And I remember they had a big old uh, bathtub on four legs. And they'd bring them in and uh, uh, bundle them in packages of 25. And Grandpapa didn't mind at all if there were 26 or 27. Don't short it, but put a couple extra in. That was all right, especially if the plant didn't look too Of course, if the plant didn't look too good, throw it out. Mm -hmm. And then they were t tied with twine. And, and I believe that after that, then they took, and they took this bathtub and they rinsed them in there before they were packed. Take off a lot of the, I guess, a lot of the extra. And also it- Give made, them a drink. And made them moist, that's right, before they were packed up. And the men, uh, or women, would stand in holes that were, so that they were not leaning over too much, but you stand in a hole with the packing crate right in front of you. Because it's hard work to have stand and lean over. And there were two or three of these holes, not so by so, and they would pack the plants in those crates and pack them in good and tight so that they, they would remain moist until they got where they were going. If you pack them too loosely, they'll get loose and they'll dry out. Mm. And then a lot of them will be dead before they get to the place. Then on smaller orders of anywhere from, I think the smallest order was usually 25, but then they would get up to where they needed to use a small crate and pack them uh, in bundles with uh, paper and wrap twine around that together, which would help to keep them moist, and then you uh, pack them up that way. And that was then they were taken to the post office. And at one time, the W. F. Allen Company um, was the largest uh, con customer of the Salisbury Post Office in their plant plant shipping department. Now, if I'm living in Illinois in 1890, how do I find out about the W.F. Allen Company? Well, they did a great deal of advertising. And, you know, they had different farm magazines. And um, there was one called Bagology. Well, that was different types of supplies for farms. Mm -hmm. And I remember Dad getting that regularly. But they would advertise in those, and they would just be little tiny squids. But there'd be uh, growers from all over the country who would put their ads in for whatever it was they were growing. And people would get those and then uh, write to W.F. Allen Company for a catalog. And then we would, um, I've addressed many a, a catalog envelope by, by hand. Well, by hand, that's right. And you're left-handed, by the uh, way. Yes, it was a very painful thing. But I, right here, when I, by the time I had children, I had to sit here, you know, and bring the work in here, and I would have the card file, and I would write envelopes, and, you know, and then they would take them back to the office and fill them sometimes. I don't think I ever filled them here because they had the boxes of the catalogs. Any and, recollection... Betsy, where maybe some of those catalogs went, did they go to a lot of other states? Oh, not only to other states, but to other countries. Oh, my land. Yes, they shipped to uh, other. Now, of course, they had to get the um, uh, inspection for different, uh, what do they call red steel, I think, was something that would kill the plants. And there were other different kinds of things that would affect the roots and anything that was harmful and they had to state that they had been inspected by the Maryland Agriculture Department that these things had been inspected and in fact out at the um, on Quantico Road what they call it now, now the, the, uh, yeah, yeah but the inspection the, station the, out yeah the agricultural station out there they had a tent well not that was not connected to WF Allen Company to my knowledge uh, but they had a tent out there where inside ground was sterilized and, and nothing was to get in there to infect the plants that were being raised there. Mm. And that was, it was so the sun could come through. Yeah. And, and so it got plenty yeah, of sunlight. I remember that. Yeah. Well, that's what they did to avoid the infection of the root diseases that 
would, would get into them. Mm -hmm. I mean, they had to be very careful, and, and, and the, the inspection certificate had to accompany each package of plants. So it was tied into the bundle. It was a little orange card, a little yellow card that was printed on it that was inspected. Did the, the Rayner brothers and the Brittingham, Jim Brittingham's operation of sending, doing pretty much the same yeah, thing with right. strawberry plants, did, they, did those companies begin after Mr. Allen? I don't Mr. really Allen? know, but I do remember that sometimes you would run short of a particular variety. They had 20, 25 different varieties of plants. I don't know, Catskill and Everbearer, I don't remember all the names. Oh. And um, sometimes you'd run short, or Rainer Brothers would run short, and so they would exchange plants, but they knew that they were all being grown under the same conditions with the same inspections and so forth so that they could do that and and they were very cooperative with each other so that if somebody was running of course if they both ran short why they were mm -hmm. both short the the brittinghams and the rainers and the allens was mm -hmm. there a lot of competition between the three companies i don't believe so i don't uh, ever remember hearing there being any particular problem uh, in fact, with the Rayner brothers, um, as I think I mentioned, if one company was uh, either the Allens or the Rayners were short of a particular variety of strawberry plant, and the other had uh, sufficient for their needs and, and their their customers, they they would uh, trade back and forth. Now, just what the monetary, I'm sure they kept track of how many sure. plants, but this way, then each uh, of them could satisfy their customers uh, without having to write to them and say, hey, we don't have these available. Well, if they're available in the area. Because really, there was competition, I suppose, in some of it, but not really, certainly nothing ever nasty that I ever remember. To try to get a picture of that time, a lot of farmers, I'm told, would till 50 or a hundred acre farm was considered a pretty good sized farm. Well, and we yet, had we had a large farm down below Allen, which was called the Cotman Farm. Now, I don't know how many acres that was, but one time my dad told me uh, that it probably was the largest single area of strawberry plants in the country mm. for that. Now, just that season, because they're all dug up <laughs> each year, mm -hmm. and and it wouldn't wouldn't be the same. Um, so they had to save back some of the strawberry oh, yes. plants. Oh yes, they kept a stock. Yeah, to, and, to, and re, to, to, re, to replant. And them. develop new, new, uh, new plants, because they take the new yeah, tight they, plants. Yeah, well they, they, they mainly use the new plants for, and my dad, I somewhere have a picture of his, he took a, uh, a peanut plant digger that they used down in, you know, Georgia, in Georgia, in that area. And he changed the design of it so that it, they could use it to, to dig strawberry plants. And it would just go under and take up a whole row of strawberry plants at one time. And I have a picture of that somewhere, don't ask me where. Well, I remember on uh, Pemberton Drive uh, seeing that type of machinery and mm -hmm. the tractor would pull that along, and behind mm -hmm. that was a wagon, uh -huh. and the plants would go in. And, yeah, and that, a, a that was always during cold weather, early spring. Early, early I mean, spring. it might yeah. be January, February. Yeah, but, but they were they would get them ready, and then ship them when the mm -hmm. orders came in. I guess in, right. in the yeah. early spring. Well, they didn't. I don't think they held back too many and put in storage or anything like that. Uh, now they did was with peaches and apples, they put those in storage. And uh, Messick Ice Company, I think they had a whole section there where they put that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But um, I think they pretty much dug the plants. And of course, they were full of dirt when they came in, so they had to, well, they called it cleaning the plants to get ready for shipping. Not that they got all the sand out of them, but. Which helps when, when customers are satisfied that they're getting the variety that they want. Uh, see, some strawberry plants ripen earlier and some later in the season. 
so just like a lot of fruit yeah. and things. So anyhow, at one one time, uh, one while, one summer after, I think it was after I was out of college, I worked up there in the plant packing house and um, putting the postage on, would weigh the packages of plants. And, and these were plain old postage stamps. It wasn't any postage meter or anything. Huh. But um, we had to apply the proper postage to the to the packages, which I did that. Not on the crates so much. The men did that because they get pretty heavy. But I did all the wrapped packages. Mm -hmm. So the mail had to get to the destination uh, before those plants dried out. So three or four days, oh, do you yeah, suppose? Oh, yeah, they've tried to. Yeah. Yes, I mean, pack them well and try to get them. And uh, anyhow, you asked about how my grandmother might have been involved in this. Well, she managed the office and did a lot of the bookkeeping. Of course, later on, we hired a bookkeeper. But um, she managed, and there was a lot to do in the office, believe me. I mean, because you had, you got, uh, like with a plant, you got orders, and you had to fill the orders. You had and, to ship out the catalogs. Well, yeah, you know, shipping out the catalogs, of course, was first. And then when you got the orders in, uh, and they'd come in on, on um, but the catalogs had an order blank in them. I think they did have uh, the envelopes with the address, I mean, the W.F. Allen Company address on them so that they would get to the right place. And then when they would come back, then we had to, to type out, and I learned Hunt and Peck by that time, and there were four of us that would sit, this was also after I was out of college, um, would, would sit and, and type the orders, and then that would go to the plant packing house where they put the orders together and, and um, you know, wrapped them up, got them ready for shipping. Now they did take them by truck, and I think out of the post office, most of them did go by truck. That, that was the plants, though, not mm. the fruit. Mm -hmm. The mm. fruit went. Now Uncle Lee managed, he did most of the telephoning to New York and Philadelphia and other places like that to get the orders for the peaches and apples so they knew how many bushels to ship to the various cities um, where they were being ordered. He, he would get on the telephone and call and, and uh, make those arrangements. Mm -hmm. um, was, w was there ever um, big barrels that they put apples in? I can remember. I, don't, I seem to remember, but I, I guess maybe it could have been a barrel that Dad came down with one, one time, but most of the time he'd come home with a bushel basket uh -huh. of apples. Yeah. And... Uh, a bushel and, or a peck of apples. Yeah. Well, bushel most part. And different kinds. Different oh, yeah. Kinds well, I think uh, Macintosh and uh, Yellow Delicious, they're the two mm. best tasting ones, I mm -hmm. think. Um, I'm trying to think what some of the other varieties were, are. Yeah. Uh, but do I, you, do you, have you ever saved one of the old catalogs? Again, I have those around here somewhere. <laughs> as many as you sent out, there must oh, have. I yeah. bet that would be. Well, interesting. I think Dick probably has a larger collection because he he stayed in it for a number of years until he got ill. Uh -huh. um, after, um, you know, the rest of us were all doing different things. But as I say, he, in a sense, bought into the company, and mm -hmm. he's he was the last. The last of the Allens in La the last in the, ones in that particular in that business. business, yeah. Because of yeah. course he's not at all well now. But, I understand but, that. Uh, were, were the 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 uh, apples and peaches shipped by train? Train uh, mainly. Train. Yeah. So mm -hmm. he would sell Very, car loads of them. Oh yeah. yes, yes, oh, yeah. yes. I mean, you know, I don't know how many hundred bushels they'd have in a in a car load, but I mean, and you had to keep them moving quickly, so that they wouldn't because the longer fruit sat, <laughs> and if the if the fruit was too ripe, well, that's you'd when sell it, it. That's when put on the fruit stand. Sell it locally. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So anyhow, then they to get back to the peaches and apples. Of course, my dad had a fit. If anybody mistreated, if you picked up a, a peach or something and gave it a toss, duh, no, uh -huh. no, because that would bruise it, and bruised fruit does not travel well, it doesn't sell well, but uh, they, would, they would grade it 
and then, you know, pack it up. Well, uh, it was along, I think, in the early 1940s. It may have been, a, it may have been before the Second World War, somewhere in there in the late 30s, that they built the new, the new packing house, which is now only a remnant of it left, which is their transferring now into some kind of business, I don't know what. But and they right took on off the, part of it for that, not McDonald's, but one of those short yeah, order places. Yeah, parties. Oh, okay. So it's right there, on, it still was on the railroad. That, oh yes, yeah, yeah. well that Backed was up the, the logical railroad. Sure. place for it to be. I mean, you don't want it too blocked. But away. Betsy, the picture you've painted for us is Camden Avenue. Is the main north-south road. That's right. That's the state highway. That's right. There is no Route 13. That's correct. And and where the college is now, yes, south of the college, was W. F. Allen land property, right? And where a lot of the enterprise, including the office and everything, was. And that land was uninterrupted all the way back to the railroad, the railroad track. That's correct. That was all farmland. That's right. And that's, it's hard for us to imagine that now. I know. I but, know. Um, and, well, where were, and then as, I guess, Mr. Allen, Mr. W.F. Allen, yes. kept expanding the amount of land for more orchards and more, more I strawberry. I don't know. I don't remember. I wasn't privy to knowing when land purchases were made. Uh, it wasn't any of my business particularly. Yeah. I mean, he was building the business. Yeah. You said your grandfather acquired a lot of he, land. Yes, he did. And, and, but I don't remember just as the, what the purpose entirely was, except, of course, for the orchards, which you need a lot of land for order for if you're going to have any size orchards. Um, but, and then I guess it was more of the things here in town, you might say. Um, that he would sell off lots and people would just have, I don't remember whether he sold them for something like a couple hundred dollars for a building lot and uh, and people could pay off at something like $10 a month. Or so. yeah. I, don't, I don't know just yeah. what the figures were, but something fairly inexpensive. Yeah. And, uh, and Grandpapa always wanted to be fair. He never, Wanted to cheat anybody out of anything. Well, you said the the rule was never short anybody on a That's dozen right. plants. But if you put no, one well, or two more in, it was okay. Usually the packages were 25 plants, but it was fine if it was probably even up to 30. I mean, but you sort of kept the bundles about the same size, too. But mm -hmm. uh, uh, So if the plants were running small, maybe you'd put more in. And, um, of course... At one time, he owned up to College Avenue, the whole thing. My dad plowed corn where Holloway Hall is now. Oh, my. And, uh, of course, that's been a long time ago because Holloway Hall was built in 1925, I believe, the year that I was born. So, um, and I, I remember when the south wing of Holloway Hall was built because I was in, I don't know, first, second grade, and we used to have to take our lunches to school with us in little lunch pails or brown paper bags. And, the, and, and they had a milk monitor that brought our milk in at noon for us. Mm. And when they opened up the new dining room, which is now the south end of Holloway Hall, um, we were marched over and we had to be very prim and proper going over there. But that's where then after that, that's where we always ate our lunches in there. But I remember when that was built so Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Allen yes. raised four, four sons. Four sons, that's right. One of whom was your father, that's Fulton. And tell us about the four sons and what they did and how they were involved okay. with the business. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, my Uncle Walter was the firstborn. My dad was born in uh, 1892, so apparently there was one child each year for four years. Oh. I, now, I'm not absolutely certain that's correct, but they were very close together. And looking at that picture, um, you can see that they were quite close together. Um, Uncle, let me just look here. Yeah. Um, the eldest, Uncle Walter, uh, he was first born. He became a Baptist missionary and went to India, or, well, Burma, 
oh. and was right where this Malamar, where all the hurricane and flooding oh, is. Oh, is going now. on now, today. Yeah, it's I going mean, on, yeah, yeah, yeah. right now. And um, his daughter Gladys, who was a medical missionary there a number of different times, uh, is quite concerned about what's happening to the people there because she was very familiar. A lot of her childhood was was there. Hmm. Well, he was Baptist. Uh, he apparently was a wonderful guy. I never knew him because he died three months before I was born. He died of typhoid fever. Okay, then my father was the second one, born in, in uh, 1892. And uh, he and his two other brothers are were the ones who were, quote, the Allen boys. And they, uh, of course, joined with their parents in the W.F. Allen Company. And my father uh, went to the University of Maryland. It was then an agricultural college. And uh, then Uncle Lee went to Cornell. I'm not really sure where Uncle Albert attended, but they all three graduated from, in fact, all four of them graduated from college. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, as I say, Uncle Lee managed the getting the fruit orders to Philadelphia, New York. And Spent a lot of time on the telephone. And, and yes, that's right. And Uncle Albert and Dad, um, really, they managed the orchards, the spray program, um, the machinery, and all that kind of thing. I mean, they, they really did the, the hard work. Dad, mm -hmm. Dad worked on the machinery up until he was, I don't know, in his 70s, practically. Is that right? And uh, one of the men on the farm, uh, told me, I can't remember the guy's name, he says, I keep an eye on your dad because I don't want him falling into that machinery. Yeah. <laughs> and when dad was getting kind of feeble. Mm -hmm. So anyhow, that's... Tell us about the uh, home that W.F. Allen built in 1905. That, he, where, where the four boys were born was a farmhouse that was further down uh, Camden Avenue. And I think it was back where, if you go across uh, from Pine uh, Pine Bluff and go back on that street off of Camden, I think it was back in there, probably several hundred feet. And it was an old style farmhouse, you know, T T shape. Sure. And that's where they were born. That house, when after Grandpapa built the new house, uh, that house was taken and put into two parts and moved up on the home farm and was a, a tenant houses and for some of the uh, supervisors, mm -hmm. which worked out very well. Uh, Grandpapa built that house, which could still be standing today, a real jewel for the university if had powers that be at that time decided. In about 1956 or 57, that, um, that it had termites. My cousins who lived there, Florence Bird and Gladys, said it no more had termites than you or I have in our heads. Uh, it was well constructed, intended to last 100, 150 years minimum, and it had only been there a little over 50 years. Mm. Um, and but the powers that be decided they wanted. Wouldn't it be a wonderful center now for the gardens that the mm. college is working on? Well, anyhow, I remember the day that I found out it was being torn down. It had been sold to the state for the college, and I was up there with my two older daughters. My baby one wasn't around yet. So they were about probably one and two years of age, somewhere in there. And while I was collecting vegetables, where all those little ranch houses are now, mm -hmm. uh, they've, that was a vegetable garden, and grand, grandmother's flower garden was there, and they had all kinds of annuals and stuff. I can remember getting a, asparagus from there, too, which I loved. And uh, anyhow, I heard all this banging and crashing going on up at what we called the big house. And I thought, what is going on? And so when I got with my vegetables, I went over to the bottom of the hill. They were throwing the interior doors out through my grandparents' bedroom windows. I just stood there and bawled. Mm. I was, 
I asked Dave, why didn't you at least tell me they were going to tear the house down? I didn't know it. You know, mm -hmm. It was a real shock to me. But when it was in its prime, and we kids would go up there every Christmas, and Grandmother and Grandpapa were very nice. I mean, we kids could run all over that house, anywhere we wanted to. We played hide-and-seek. We slid down the banister. We had a wonderful time there. The one thing we were cautioned to stay away from was that those turrets on two corners there, the windows in them, the glass was actually curved. Mm. So they took the... Uh, Grandpapa was, had foresight, and he bought, knowing the glass will get broken sometimes, so he had bought, I don't know, 10 or 12 extra panes of glass, curved, big curved panes of glass, had them stored on the third floor, which also had full rooms on it. And that was the one thing we children were stay away from that stack of glass. I think they had paper between each pane to protect them. So we did. We, but we, we had a wonderful time. You could get, there was one place where I think my cousin Dick could get down in between the floor and the ceiling of the room below. And then he could hide in there and nobody would find him. <laughs> but And every Christmas we would go up there Christmas Day and uh, have you know, get gifts and just have fun with all the, with all our cousins. Yeah. So your father and two of his brothers, uh, Lee and Albert, yeah. your father Fulton, were involved in the W.F. Allen Company um, way up into the, into the 40s. Well, uh, well, and then of course Dick took over and he had, he gained an interest in the company country and, and I mean got a part of the country, a company uh -huh. and uh, he handled the uh, we sort of had to start I tell you labor is the big problem see way back you would have your uh, uh, migrant workers that would start in Florida with the oranges and grapefruit and then they'd work up and picking tomatoes and all that and they'd get here and they'd pick the peaches and apples and also help with the digging of the plants and this sort of thing. And then when that season was over, they'd keep on up into up the, the East Coast. And, um, but when you can't, and they've made so many regulations now that um, I'm not saying these poor guys had it easy. They didn't. We had uh, some Haitian workers and, and so forth. They, they didn't have an easy time of it at all. But we never, I don't remember ever really having it. Somebody get drunk once in a while and they'd go bail them out of jail <laughs> outside of that. I mean, just normal things. Uh -huh. But I don't ever recall there ever being a murder or anything of that yeah. sort yeah. Uh, on the farm. And we children felt very safe around them. I never questioned, yeah. you know, working around them. Well, grew up with them. Yeah. The, um, the Allen family had extensive land holdings. I think you mentioned that there are several streets that were named well, from this the family kind, members. Yeah, off of, uh, what is it now, Eastern Shore Drive, I think it is. There are some, there's a row of four little houses there. I'm not sure that my grandfather had anything to do with them, but he might have. But there are streets, uh, there's Fulton Street, Albert Street, Lee Street, and Kendall Street. Now, see my... Uncle Walter's second name was Kendall, mm -hmm. and and there are four streets in there. You you have to kind of look around for them, but they're they're just short little streets. Didn't amount to a whole lot, but uh, and just why Grandpapa put those names to them in that location, I don't know. But you mentioned that your grandfather was uh, influential in that he was a county commissioner. That's right. Mm -hmm. But that when uh, the my uncle Lee was also Lee was yeah, also yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you mentioned that when they were going to put 13, Route 13 down, uh, the proposal was to put it down next to the railroad. Next to the railroad track, yeah, that's so what, what they... So what did Grandpa say <laughs> about that? Well, Grandpapa said, no, don't put it next to the railroad track because you have all that, you, you cut out businesses. You, you'll only have business on one side of the street. Move it over a, a block and put the Route 13 business through there and then... Uh, you have that space between the Route 13 and the railroad track for other businesses, and that's where they are. Of course, right now we need to have a, a another 
street going up next to the railroad track because the railroad, of course, isn't used as much anymore for, they don't have as many sidings and so forth. But the, um, we need a main north route going up and a main south route coming down. And after they get that northeast collector going, the traffic right now at the corner of Business 13 and College Avenue is horrendous mm -hmm. in, in the afternoon, mm -hmm. and it's going to be worse. And they need to have some way of, and, and they, right now it's fairly clear they could build it almost from like Vine Street all the way down to practically Fruitland, or, or at least down to the Tony Tank Creek. And they could have a whole separate highway coming up. I keep talking about it. My opinion doesn't count. <laughs> well, I'm not so sure that's the case. But uh, so your 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 dad and your uncles. Well, yes. the one uncle was the missionary, the Baptist missionary. That's right. In Burma. Right. And spent his lifetime over there. Well, I no, I mean they would come home different times, but because uh, my cousins were here when they were, well, this I guess was after he had died. But because uh, there's only a couple years difference between me and Florence Bird and Gladys, um, but I think he had come home different times. But like I say, when when he died, I hadn't been born yet, mm -hmm. so I never did see him. So a lot of cousins. Oh yes, there were uh, eight of us. Eight of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, where did you develop your interest in the? I don't want to say politics in that you <laughs> no. run for office, but uh, you are definitely interested in county and city business. Well, I've, I've always, how I got it, I don't know, but I always like to help people. And um, I like to do nice things for nice people. I always have. And I, I remember a movie that I saw when I was a child, or no more than a child, and it was something about infants, babies, and where these nurses were holding and nurturing these infants. And I thought, that's what I want to do. I want to look at So um, when I got in college, I, it was sort of related. I took all the sociology courses that, that I could and graduated with a, a BA in sociology. And um, I came home and my thought was to get into social work. Well, my parents wanted me to get into nursing. They thought that would be the better thing. So I did, I went to, to Philadelphia for two years and took a nurse's training at uh, the woman's hospital. Now this is not the woman's college hospital. This one was, and I believe it's been torn down since, at uh, Preston and Parrish Streets. Mm. And I had two years there, and then like a dummy, I wanted to get married. Mm. And of course, they wouldn't keep me because I'd have a baby within a year, and then I wouldn't be any use to them. <laughs> Duh. Well, in any case, um, I still wanted to get married, and I did. Here at PGH, they would have let me come back, but they would have added six months to my training. And uh, 18 months, you know, I'd... so I didn't do that, but I worked different I worked in the post office for a while, uh, locally, and um, I worked at W.F. Allen Company in the office and doing various things. And then um, I, I wanted to get into social work. And uh, of course my dad, because my marriage dissolved, I had three beautiful girls, but no marriage. Dad helped me keep this house, which I'm very thankful for. and. Um, Anyhow, so I did finally get a job with the Wicomico County Department of Social Services. And I worked there 19 and a half years. Oh, okay. And, uh, and then I was able to take early retirement. And when I found out that I could get the, my uh, retirement, if I vested my retirement until I reached age 60. So at age 58 and a half, I retired. Are you 60 yet? Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you know better. <laughs> but I was still very interested, and, and I, I got along very well with my clients. And 
you know, very seldom did I have a problem. I had more problem with dumb dogs that were roaming around, you know. In fact, one of our workers actually got bit on the calf of her leg, a foster care worker, oh, wow. and that was pretty bad. Um, but I, I was very careful about dogs, and I never did get bitten. Uh, but I loved that. When I started, Miss Beatrice Pryor was mm -hmm. the directress at that time. Well, I got along fine with my clients, but I found that the administration sort of went as far as I was concerned, downhill, and less respect for the workers. I mean, you didn't have sense enough to come in out of the rain, but you were responsible. You had to have the beeper over the weekends and nights for a week at a time and be responsible if a child was abused. Mm. And we only had a very short period of training, no real, and, and had to go and find out, investigate what was happening. Well, you could run into angry parents, all kinds of things. Thankfully, I didn't have too much happen on my watch with that. But that really bothered me. Mm. And different things happened that just, it, it So I the idea But I men. still wanted to help people. So the first thing I did when I retired was I went over to Deer's Head when they had, this is not the, um, uh, the, the sanatorium. No. Oh. Uh, Deer's Head. State Hospital. Yeah, yeah. Um, what am I trying to say? The um, coastal hospice is there now. Well, this was a hospice, uh -huh. uh, a can you know, for cancer and that sort of thing. Right. But this is not where coastal hospice. This was a older setup and had dissolved after a number of years. I went over there three years three afternoons a week for three hours. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. These poor people were dying mostly of cancer. And we, I had some very interesting experiences with some of those patients. Mm -hmm. And there was one gentleman there who had uh, throat cancer. And I went in and he was pointing to something across the room. And I, but he couldn't talk, of course. And uh, I was trying to figure, what is he pointing at? He wants something. And I found out finally he wanted a mirror so that he could clean his own... Uh, the, the trach. The yeah. tracheotomy. Yeah. And so I got him one. Well, of course, he'd lose his temper once in a while. He threw the mirror in front of the nurses and it got broken. And we'd, if we'd had a, a steel one that was appropriately protected on the edges, that might have worked better. But anyhow. But I played cards with him. I think it was hearts. But I had to play by his rules. And sometimes he'd deal out the proper number, and sometimes he'd deal out the whole deck, practically. <laughs> and, uh, but he couldn't, still couldn't speak. I could not get him to keep score. I had paper and pencil there, but he wouldn't do it. And, you know, finally I figured out, he was an older black man. I said, you know, I think I figured out that you were raised on a farm and worked all your life. He kept nodding his head. I said, and you never had an opportunity to go to school. He was totally illiterate. Is that right? And the poor man, and then of course they couldn't talk. So he, I mean, he had... No a, wonder he was frustrated. Of course he was frustrated. Yeah. But, you know, I would go in afternoons and sit with him and we'd play cards or... As I, a volunteer. Just, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I didn't, I didn't even want to be paid for that. When I do volunteer stuff, I'm volunteering. I don't expect anything except the satisfaction of having tried to help somebody. Now, when did you start attending county and city well, government probably, meetings? Well, probably, I don't recall exactly, but it was probably, I, I didn't have time really before I retired because I was busy. And of course, it hadn't been that long since my last child was in college. And um, so I, but I started going to city and county council meetings and to the mayor's round table, which I still attend. Uh, and I also got it in voice. <laughs> well, I would not pay their dues. And of course, I disagreed with a great deal of what they were trying to do. And, but I'd go and I'd listen. And if I felt I could make a comment about something, because I think, I think that uh, 
restriction on the, I mean, you told me about that, how you had to bite the bullet finally and, and raise the taxes after several years of no, I mean, I had several years when there was no raise in my taxes, maybe a dollar. And you needed more, the county needed more money. And then they put this 2% restriction on. Well, come on, you know, and, and that's why the schools don't have what they need now. So were you and, a popular member of Voice? Oh, heavens no. In fact, <laughs> <laughs> in fact, I was invited not to come anymore. Oh, my land. Oh, yes. Yes, oh. I was booted. Uh-huh. And uh, so anyhow, and I went one more time. There was something else. that Elfie's meetings were supposed to be open. Duh. Anyhow, I went one more time. I didn't really realize, I don't think, that it was a voice meeting. But I went in and Don... What's Coffin. His name? Coffin. He said, well, I'll let you be here this time as my guest. I thought, that's nice of him. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, that, that's one of the experiences that, 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 uh, uh, that I had. The trying, trying to help the county without actually being involved in the politics. And then um, different things, I, I've been in the, um, currently, I say currently, I'm in the recycling program, and I've been in that for 10 years now. But I feel we've been spinning our tires and not getting the kind of uh, support from the city that we actually need. And in my opinion, until we get mandatory recycling, it's not gonna go. I have taken information around, I've tried to encourage recycling, I recycle myself. And then when you go out and you see cardboard sticking up out of the tops of things, they can get money for that cardboard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you can't get the people to separate it out, flatten it down and, and call in to say they've got it. On Mondays, they have to do it separately because the truck only carries, it doesn't have a department, a section on it. They've got plastic, glass, paper, I can't think what else, uh, you know, compartments in it. But they don't have one, so they have to pick up the cardboard on Mondays when they pick up yard debris and mm. such. So I have tried to be, and now we, Harry White is the coordinator for the recycling, and I've tried to be very supportive of him. He's very interested, yeah. and I want to see him do well in, in this. And, of course, it would save the city. Well, that's thousands it. of dollars I, I, I in plan, tipping fees. I plan to speak tonight. <laughs> I'm ready <laughs> to, at the city council meeting tonight, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm planning to be there. And I've given Harry White, the coordinator, a copy of what I plan to say, and asked him to give me a call if he wants me to change anything or if he doesn't want me to say it at all. I'll. I want to cooperate with him. How long, him. this is a beautiful home, how long have you lived here on Somerset Avenue? I moved in here on November 18th, 1952, my father's 60th birthday. And it, the back part of the house wasn't here at that time, it was a five room house. Um, the two bedrooms, living room, dining room, and kitchen. And of course the bathroom, maybe you count that as. Anyhow, uh, but after I had three children, my father, when my husband and I broke up, my father saved the house for me. And so, but three children in two bedrooms, the children could only play out here mm -hmm. in the living room, and they did. But um, Dad agreed with me that I needed more space. So he said, well, do you want a house in another location where we can get you three bedrooms at least? And I said, no, I've got such wonderful neighbors. I've been here 50, could be 56 years this fall. And I couldn't have a better neighborhood to live in. Mm -hmm. I, I really, I've wonderful, cooperative, helpful neighbors. I'm not saying they've, we haven't had one or two rotten apples, but you well, know. Well, you can also walk to the to the very area where you grew up and where oh, yeah, your well, grandfather I'm, had his I'm, business. I'm, and... I'm one mile from where I was born and one mile from where I was raised. <laughs> and I could actually walk either direction if I wanted to. Now, some of the Allen land over the years have been, uh, the, the family is divested. Um, tell us about the prominent land that uh, where the center of Salisbury is. Yes, that was, that, that was Peach's 
peach that was orchards. a peach orchard. Oh, yeah. And also on the other side of Route 13 up there was what I think they called it the Leonard Farm. And it had peaches. Oh, it was a big area. That's where my dad taught me how to drive. <laughs> <laughs> and we were coming out to the main highway, Route 13, one time. And and he was. I was just beginning, you know. I was about Now, what kind of 15. car was this? Oh, uh, what well, year it, was it? It probably was a, a Chrysler of some kind, either a Plymouth or a, uh, probably a Plymouth, I don't know. Anyhow, I was coming up, and Dad says, stop, stop, I, which one's the brake? <laughs> I soon learned which one was the brake. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you this question. When you and your cousins were growing up, yeah. did you like peaches and apples and strawberries. We better like them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my mother would, she'd put up peaches in the summertime, can them. Oh. And I tell you, when the peaches came along, we kids were uh, forced. I hate to use that word, That's but we were commissioned, not commissioned. We were, and, and we were, anyhow, we had to sit with a pan of peaches on our lap and cut them in half, take the pit out, peel them very carefully and put them in another bowl. And mother would rinse them and pack them in the jars and she made the sugar syrup and, and then put them in and then a hot water bath and, and, and you know, for so many, you know, and then tighten. But she wouldn't let us hang around when she was tightening down the jars because if one of them broke, you know, stuff could spatter all over. But we would sit for hours with a pan of, of, of peaches on our laps. But you got to eat peaches all year long. Oh, well, as long as they lasted, yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, um, we, uh, uh, and apples, Dad would bring down, a, I remember one time he brought a whole barrel of apples down practically. And, and uh, oh, that was one thing with Dad. They made cider sometimes in the fall. So we had- They we, never let it turn hard or anything, did they? Oh, no, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> But in any case, we, the, um, uh, of course, when they were making cider, they had to strain it in these burlap bag things, I don't know, and they had grommets on them because they fastened them into something. So anyhow, but they had to be washed once in a while. So we had what we called an easy washer and had the big tub where you washed things and then you, a small thing where you put for rinsing and so that you could use the wash water for more than one load of laundry. Well, anyhow, he brought those home one time. And so he and I went down the basement, we stuck them in the washing machine and we washed them. Well, when we got done, we discovered that some of these grommets had made little chinks in the enamel of the inside of the wash tub. Uh -oh. He says, we just won't tell Granny about this, will we? <laughs> I said, no, indeed. <laughs> you were very close with your dad? Uh, Dad and I got along quite well, which I think made Mother jealous, but I couldn't help it if Dad and I could get along, yeah. and, and he, he and Mother didn't have a very good relationship. But Well, you described your father as a dude, a handsome dude, Well, and yeah, we have yeah, a picture of him here, here. This is, I and guess he this certainly was, was a nice-looking oh, man. Oh, indeed so. He yeah. was indeed. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and he was in Community Players. Oh. oh yeah, he and mother were, were charter members oh. of community players. And uh, he he was not really much of an actor. He was in a few things, but he had very minor parts. But he but enjoyed, he enjoyed it. But he enjoyed it and one time they had after parties, you know, after the last show. And they generally would go to the English Grill or someplace like that and you know, the the sta the um, not the staff, but the staff uh, the, the actors. The, the, the players, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyhow, they would go to English Grill. One time, Dad, he, he had a great sense of humor when he felt like having it. And he went in one time, and he staggered around, and they all thought he was drunk. <laughs> they thought he'd been out drinking between the... He wasn't drunk any more than that. He was acting. But he was acting, and he was, he was having a great time with them. He had them all stressed out. <laughs> And uh, I don't think a one time Dad did get drunk. He was a little boy, and our Aunt Kate and Uncle Tom Taylor, Tom Taylor, lived out in Mardella, 
and I don't know if some relation to Grandpapa and Grandmama, who incidentally were cousins. But anyway, um, uh, uh, Aunt Kate was making wine. You know, I don't know whether it was gooseberry wine or just what kind. And Uncle Tom was out on the, with the mules out in the middle of the field plowing. So Aunt Kate sent Dad out with some wine to Uncle Tom. <laughs> but she'd been giving him tastes here and there. So here Dad's trying to get across this plowed field <laughs> with the wine for Uncle Tom. <laughs> And he was staying. Well, of course, a plowed field is not an easy thing to walk through. He was just a anyhow. boy. Huh? And he, he was, was just, just a young a boy. boy. Yeah, yeah, probably six, seven years old. And and uh, when Uncle Tom came in, Aunt, Aunt Kate said to him, Fulton was having trouble getting across that plowed field. Fulton wasn't having trouble. He was drunk. <laughs> <laughs> so, and Dad told that on himself. Uh -huh. And then there was the time that this was back when they lived in the house down here off that was old before Tony before Tank. Grandpapa built that house, oh. the old farmhouse where he was born. And um, so they had a company come in from Mardell. Well, back then, if somebody came from that distance, they stayed overnight because I guess they came by horse and buggy or something. So they put Dad over in another bedroom with probably with one of his brothers and so they could accommodate this couple. And I guess it was a double bed, I don't know. Anyhow, in the morning, when they woke up, her dad was between them. <laughs> dad in his sleep had gotten up and walked over and gotten in the bed with this couple. <laughs> and dad was so embarrassed because he'd gotten in bed with this couple. And he knew he wasn't supposed to, but he apparently had walked back to his familiar. Well, it was his bed. Yeah, right. <laughs> After so, all. Yeah. yeah. yeah which, so different things like that. If, and, they, and he's told me about, you know, things like that that, have occurred. Yeah. So it's like my some... children now, I'll tell them something, Mom, you've never told us about that before. Write it, give us. So I'm trying to write my life story, as, as uh, Tom knows. That's good. And um, I've got bits and pieces and so forth together. Well, you, uh, you've you led a very interesting life, and you come from a family that's uh, been very prominent here in Wicomico County for a hundred and some years. And uh, we're delighted that you've taken time to uh, bring us up to date. What, you one want to tell one us other a little, little more? thing that, that Grandmama told me one time, that when she and Grandpapa were courting, they had their corn cob pipes and they'd sit out in the- Both of them? Each of them would have a corn cob pipe, yeah. And they'd sit out and smoke their corn cob pipes, <laughs> 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 which I think is, is kind of fun. Yeah. You know. Corn cob pipes and and she was a twilly. She was a twilly. Now was she from Salisbury or Mardella? I Mardella, think, I think. Yeah. That's the connection through her yeah. to the Mardella. And then, uh, they had a cousin, or uh, the, I don't know. If, I guess it was a cousin of, of Grandpapa's too, Cora Twilly, who was an orphan. So Grandpapa brought her in, and and she lived with them the rest of her life. She was oh. a maiden, maiden aunt, and she was a, she was a very strong, but you asked about, um, we had Presbyterians, Uncle Lee and Uncle Albert, I think were both Presbyterians. Grandpapa and Grandmama, I think were, were Methodists. Of course, Uncle Walter was Baptist. Aunt Cora went to the, was a Baptist, I think. And um, how my mother, and my dad, I think he'd really preferred Unitarianism which is one thing I have always regretted, that I never really, he was afraid, I think, to talk to me because Mother was so adamant that I had to believe what she told me I had to believe. And Dad was afraid of causing too much of a ruckus. And that. you ended up being an Episcopalian. Well, Mother, for some reason, I don't know how she, because she was raised Baptist, and how she got over to the Episcopal Church, I don't know, but that's where I was baptized and raised, right up here at St. Peter's. Yeah. Yeah. Well, a lot of us have drifted into the uh, Episcopal Church one way or well, the other, yeah, right? But I'm a, I'm a basket. <laughs> no, what do you call it? Cradle. Cradle. <laughs> Cradle. Episcopal. Cradle Episcopalian. Yeah, right. yeah. Now this, this chair, my father gave me after my children were too large to have used it uh, for any purpose. 
uh, my grandchildren have sat in it. When Dad gave it to me, the rush seat was built with, purposely with a hole in the center. I believe, and it's handmade very obviously because you can see this is not one there, but here, and not one here, but here. And uh, anyhow, it was my, my parents' potty seat with a little, some kind of a potty underneath yeah. of it. Yeah. And you can see that it's so well worn, we're backed up against a wall at some time. And with four boys using it, <laughs> and they apparently broke the arms that got mended. Mm -hmm. But I just love this little chair mount now. I've That's a unique style. This this part right here is unique. Yeah. Well, well when it's handmade, and you, can you see make it where the little shoes wore it there. Yeah. And uh, I I just think it's a lovely little. Piece. Oh, it is. It is. And uh, I, like I say, I have pictures of both of my grandchildren sitting in it, but uh, I, I just, it's a singular piece. Well, thanks for talking with us. Well, this has been a lot of fun. It has. Yeah. It sure has been for us. Well, so I hope so. We want to thank you, Julia Allen Hancock, better Ju known as Betsy. Julia Elizabeth Allen Aunt Hancock. Elizabeth Allen. Yeah. Uh, for bringing us up to date about the Allen family and telling us some of the history. And uh, we want to thank you for being with us here on Digitizing Delmarva Heritage and Tradition.